Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever had a friend who wants to join in but cannot do what you're doing? Yes, some have, Bear. Well, Ricky the Rock cannot roll. His rock friends all roll down the hill, but he can only watch the fun. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if the other rocks will try to find a way to help Ricky roll too. Ricky, the rock that couldn't roll by Jay Maletsky. Over the lake and out past the bay was a green grassy hill where the rocks came to play. They would race to the top to take in the view, then roll their way down the way rocks love to do. There were Kip, Pip, and Chester, and Marvin the Boulder. Ignatius played too, though he was much older and a group called the Pebbles never ever sat still, zigzagging their way up and over the hill. Kai was a meteorite and not from this planet, and Maya was lava but taken for granite. <laughs> Stu was the smart one, Parker the clown, and grumpy old Ebert rolled round with a frown. Gabby was sassy. Lisi had flair. Emma was giggly. And Hud had black hair. But the one trait that seemed to be shared by them all was that every rock there was shaped like a ball. And because they were round, they could easily roll through the grass, past the lake, up and over the knoll. Except for poor Ricky, who quietly sat. You see, Rick couldn't roll because one side was flat. His friends didn't get it. Come roll, they would chant. So Ricky tried, but replied, I'm sorry, I can't. But the rocks were determined. They were sure they could solve Ricky's flat-sided problem and help him revolve. So Marvin the Boulder, with his impressive physique, carried Rick all the way to the hill's grassy peak. Then he pushed him downhill, yelling, Keep rolling, kid! But Rick didn't roll. He just kind of slid. Well, the rocks weren't done. Not by a mile. Surely this next try would get Rick to smile. They stuck rubber balls all over Rick, using big gobs of glue to get them to stick. They were proud of themselves. This will work, they announced. But Ricky still couldn't roll. Now he just sort of bounced. Well, they pushed and they pulled, trying every which way to get Rick to roll. But by the end of the day, nothing had worked, just like Rick expected. And he ended up feeling depressed and dejected. It's no use, Ricky sighed. There just isn't a way. So I'll sit off to the side and watch you all play. But his friends wouldn't quit. 
We're here for you, brother, and we'll get you to roll one way or another. So they pondered and thought, each straining his brain, till they looked up and saw it was starting to rain. And that's when it hit that smart stone named Stu. Eureka! he shouted. I know just what to do. He explained to them how they would get Rick to tumble. My plan is pure genius. Stu wasn't too humble. So they carried our hero down the road about a mile to the lake where they gathered up mud they could pile on the flat side of Rick, creating a mound that they shaped, smoothed, and sculpted until it was round. Then, after the rain, with the sun in the sky, they left him to bake till the mud was all dry. They gathered up vines and one colorful feather that they wrapped all round Rick to keep it together. When the last knot was tied and the work was all done, the only step left was for Rick to have fun. They stood back and watched, feeling nervous and tense, as Rick breathed in deep with increasing suspense. He moved slowly at first, testing out his new mold, and then for the first time, Ricky the Rock rolled. So Bria the ladybug, who'd been there from the start, felt a surge of pure joy swell up in her heart. She thought as she watched her friends play on the hill that there's always a way if there's also a will. And she said to herself as Ricky rolled down the slope, when you're surrounded by love, you always have hope. There's wondering, do you think Ricky could have rolled without his friends? No bear, his friends never gave up. What would you do if your first try to help doesn't work? Keep trying, Bear. Hmm, maybe Ladybug was right. Maybe Ricky had hope because his friends loved him enough to find the way that worked. Well, Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in helping others win too. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever heard of pirate dinosaurs? Mostly knows Bear. <laughs> well, here's Captain Rex Pyrosaur right now with the newest Pyrosaur. Captain Rex's crew rules the seas, but the new small pyrosaur has to earn the crew's respect fast to be on their team. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if the new pyrosaur can help the crew find treasure. Pyrosaurs by Josh Funk. We're pyrosaurs, we're pyrosaurs, we rule the open seas. We'll cannon blast you to the past. We do just what we please. With spiky tails, we raise the sails to search for gold and more. 
We must beware, for everywhere are enemies galore. With lots to learn, I've got to earn the crew's respect and trust. I'll rise in rank or walk the plank. I hope I can adjust. When Captain Rex says, swab the decks, she points her fabled sword. I scrub and brush in such a rush, she throws me overboard. The ship is steered by Bronto Beard. He serves as lookout too. His single eye spots far and nigh when I see only blue. With handy hook, Triceracook prepares Jurassic feasts. I love to slurp and belch and burp with buccaneering beasts. The Lossomate can navigate from reef to coastal bay. I use my smarts to map the charts, but still we're led astray. Mutiny! Our ancient ship will rise and dip across the sea frontier. We boldly row until land ho! The treasure must be near. When Captain Rex says, find the X, I haven't got a clue. Beside them all, I feel quite small. I'm still so very new. The crew begins to search within the frayed and tattered map. A shadow looms. The water fumes, revealing it's a trap. From sky and sea, it couldn't be. Another dino crew? Yo ho, behold, they want the gold. These scallywags are through. As Captain Rex's muscles flex, she readies sword and claws. Velocimate can barely wait and bears his golden jaws. Kablamo! Crash! A mighty clash erupts upon the sand. But then I spot a bandit's got a piece of map in hand. Ahoy! Avast! I blurt at last. We've got to stop these duels. Let's share the scraps of each our maps to find the gold and jewels. Surprisingly, they stare at me, but nobody objects. The maps connect and they reflect the spot that's marked with X. It's been my dream to join the team. This crew and I are linked with gems, doubloons and silver spoons will never go extinct. Through battles, brawls and fireballs, plus prehistoric roars, the salty deep is ours to keep. Come join the Pyrosaurs! Bear's wondering, how do you think the new Pyrosaur made the team? Hmm. Bear thinks he was first to think of how to find the treasure. What did he say to do? If you said share, you're right. Bear's asking, did they all find the treasure by sharing instead of fighting? Well, Bear's also hoping you come back soon for more adventures in teamwork. Bye for now. Please subscribe.
Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever really, really wanted something, but your parents couldn't buy it for you? Quite a few yeses, Bear. <laughs> well, Sally Jean is about to outgrow her small bike, but her parents cannot buy her a bigger one. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if Sally Jean can figure out how to get a big bike anyway. Sally Jean, the Bicycle Queen by Carrie Best. When Sally Jean Sprocket was one year old, she sat in a seat on Mama's bike and watched the world go by. Flowers and trees, pigeons and kites, helicopters and clouds, and the round of Mama's back. Hi, she said to the big kids on their bikes. When Sally Jean turned two, Granny got her a tricycle with streamers that swished and a horn that went onk onk. She watched ants and spiders, caterpillars and bees, and two blue knees that pumped up and down. Hi, she said to the big kids on their bikes. Then she turned to four and Papa found her a yard sale bike with two small wheels that hugged the ground. Sally Jean watched baby carriages and lawn mowers, squirrels and poodles and pedals with reflectors that went round and round. Hi, she said to the big kids on their bikes. When she was five, the little wheels came off and Mama held on while Sally Jean wobbled, then learned to pedal fast. Soon Mama let go, and Sally Jean was off. Wait for me, she called to the big kids on their bikes. Sally Jean practiced going up the hill, and she practiced coming down. She zoomed across fields and boomed over bridges cut sharp corners and skidded when she stopped. Her fingers knew their places on the handlebars and her feet fit the pedals like two snap together blocks. Sally Jean and her bike became such good friends that she named it Flash. I can't just call you bike, she said. And then she sang, I'm a plane, I'm a train. I'm a girl up on a horse. I'm Sally Jean, the Bicycle Queen, and my bike is Flash, of course. Then she was six, and Flash's seat needed raising. Mama showed her what to do with a push and a pull and a hit of her hammer. You're growing like a dandelion in spring, she said, as Sally Jean watched. And soon Sally Jean was singing, I can pop a wheelie. I can touch the sky. I can pedal backwards. I can really fly. I'm Sally Jean, the Bicycle Queen. Just me, myself, and I. When Sally Jean turned seven, the handlebars needed raising. Papa showed her what to do with a left and a right and a twist of his wrench. Sally Jean liked the way she and Flash got bigger together. Sally Jean sang while she washed the wheels, and she sang while she shined the spokes. Sally Jean was so busy singing that she never noticed how big she was growing. By the time she turned eight, her knees bumped the handlebars, and her shoes scraped the ground. She had to walk Flash up the hill for the very first time. Sally Jean tried to raise Flash's seat she tried to raise Flash's handlebars, but there was no more room for raising. What do I do now? she asked. 
You can ride my bike when I'm at trumpet lesson, said Stanley. You can sit while I pedal, said Andrew the giant. You can pedal while I sit, said Murray. No thanks, Sally Jean said. A bicycle queen needs to have her own bike. Sally Jean tried skating places, but she always fell. She hopped and she skipped and she jumped and she ran, but nothing felt as good as riding. I just have to get another bike, she said. I wish I could help, said Papa, who needed new eyeglasses. Wait till next year, said Mama who had to pay the dentist. But Sally Jean couldn't wait. What do I do now, she asked. Her neighbor, Mr. Metal, had an idea. I sure could use your help in my yard, he said. And I do have lots of things you might like for your new bike. So, Every day after school, Sally Jean helped Mr. Metal organize his junk. And when she was finished, she chose a basket, a light, and a can of sparkly paint. But as she sat on the steps in front of her house and watched little kids and big kids and all kinds of bikes, Sally Jean wondered how she would ever get a bike of her own. What do I do now, she asked. Fix my flat, said Murray. I can do that, said K Sally Jean. Then she thought about what else she could do. The very next day, Sally Jean put up a sign. Pedal pushers everywhere. Have fun. Learn to fix your own bike. Reasonable rates. See Sally Jean, the BQ. And before long, she was in business. But by the end of the summer, she'd earned only enough money for two measly tires. What do I do now? Sally Jean wondered. She sat in a tree and looked all around and saw blue jays and sparrows, woodpeckers and crows, and some rusty old wheels she'd never noticed before. She saw buses and trucks, motorcycles and cars, and some dusty old pedals she couldn't ignore. This bicycle queen has an idea, she said, jumping down. But Sally Jean's heart sank as she spun the floppy pedals and felt the dried out tires. She sat there for a long time and then she started singing, I cycle, you cycle, recycle junk. That's my girl said Mr. Metal with a big smile. Her friends didn't smile when they saw what she was carrying. That thing's ready for the dump, said Stanley. What a hunk of junk, said Andrew the giant. It's all broken up, said Murray. But Sally Jean said, have no fear. The bicycle queen is here. At first, everything looked hopeless, but Sally Jean rolled up her sleeves anyway and got to work. And every afternoon after that, she worked a little more, and a little more, and a little more, until finally she had a bike. Sally Jean even gave her new bike a name, Lightning. I can't just call you bike, she said. 
but something didn't feel right until Sally Jean figured out what it was and fixed that too. I'm a plane, I'm a train, I'm a boy up on a horse. I'm Murray Bing, the bicycle king, and my bike is Flash, of course. At last, Sally Jean felt like singing again. I can ride and whistle, I can fix a flat, I can race a redbird, I'm faster than a cat. I'm Sally Jean, the bicycle queen. What do you think of that? Here's wondering, have you ever tried recycling something old into something new? A few yeses, Bear. Well, Bear's thinking he'll use a big old box to make his very own room to crawl into. Hmm, do you think Bear might even crawl into his new room to read some favorite books? Well, Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in recycling. Bye for now. Please subscribe. You found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you think a bat can act just like a bird? Most are not sure, Bear. Well, Stella Luna, the baby bat, is about to make an emergency landing in a nest of baby birds. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if Stella Luna and the birds can get along when they see how different they are. Stella Luna by Janelle Cannon. In a warm and sultry forest, far, far away, there once lived a mother fruit bat and her new baby. Oh, how Mother Bat loved her soft, tiny baby. I'll name you Stella Luna, she crooned. Each night, Mother Bat would carry Stella Luna clutched to her breast as she flew out to search for food. One night, as Mother Bat followed the heavy scent of ripe fruit, an owl spied her. On silent wings, the powerful birds swooped down upon the bats. Dodging and shrieking, Mother Bat tried to escape, but the owl struck again and again, knocking Stella Luna into the air. Her baby wings were as limp and useless as wet paper. Down, down she went, faster and faster into the forest below. dark leafy tangle of branches caught Stella Luna as she fell. One twig was small enough for Stella Luna's tiny feet. Wrapping her wings about her, she clutched the thin branch, trembling with cold and fear. Mother, Stella Luna squeaked, where are you? By daybreak, the baby bat could hold on no longer. Down, down again, she dropped. Flump! Stella Luna landed head first in a soft, downy nest, startling the three baby birds who live there. Stella Luna quickly clambered from the nest and hung out of sight below it. She listened to the babble of the three birds. What was that? cried Flap. I don't know, but it's hanging by its feet, chirped Flitter. Shh, here comes Mama, hissed Pip.
Many, many times that day, Mama Bird flew away, always returning with food for her babies. Stella Luna was terribly hungry, but not for the crawly things Mama Bird brought. Finally, though, the little bat could bear it no longer. She climbed into the nest, closed her eyes, and opened her mouth. Plop! In dropped a big green grasshopper. Stella Luna learned to be like the birds. She stayed awake all day and slept at night. She ate bugs even though they tasted awful. Her bat ways were quickly disappearing, except for one thing. Stella Luna still liked to sleep hanging by her feet. Once when Mama was away, the curious baby birds decided to try it too. When Mama Bird came home, she saw eight tiny feet gripping the edge of the nest. Eek! she cried. Get back up here this instant. You're going to fall and break your necks. The birds clambered back into the nest, but Mama Bird stopped Stella Luna. You are teaching my children to do bad things. I will not let you back into this nest until you promise to obey all the rules of this house. Stella Luna promised. She ate bugs without making faces. She slept in the nest at night. And she didn't hang by her feet. Stella Luna behaved as a good bird should. All the babies grew quickly. Soon the nest became crowded. Mama Bird told them it was time to learn to fly. One by one, Pip, Flitter, Flap, and Stella Luna jumped from the nest. Their wings worked. I'm just like them, thought Stella Luna. I can fly too. Pip, Flitter, and Flap landed gracefully on a branch. Stella Luna tried to do the same. How embarrassing! I will fly all day, Stella Luna told herself. Then no one will see how clumsy I am. The next day, Pip, Flitter, Flap, and Stella Luna went flying far from home. They flew for hours, exercising their new wings. The sun is setting, warned Flitter. We had better go home or we will get lost in the dark, said Flap. But Stella Luna had flown far ahead and was nowhere to be seen. The three anxious birds went home without her. All alone, Stella Luna flew and flew until her wings ached and she dropped into a tree. I promised not to hang by my feet, Stella Luna sighed. So she hung by her thumbs and soon fell asleep. She didn't hear the soft sound of wings coming near. Hey, a loud voice said, why are you hanging upside down? Stella Luna's eyes opened wide. She saw a most peculiar face. I'm not upside down, you are, Stella Luna said. Ah, but you're a bat. Bats hang by their feet. You are hanging by your thumbs. So that makes you upside down, the creature said. I'm a bat. I am hanging by my feet. 
That makes me right side up. Stella Luna was confused. Mama Bird told me I was upside down. She said I was wrong. Wrong for a bird, maybe, but not for a bat. More bats gathered around to see the strange young bat who behaved like a bird. Stella Luna told them her story. You ate b b bugs, stuttered one. You slept at night, gasped another. How very strange, they all murmured. Wait, wait, let me look at this child. A bat pushed through the crowd. An owl attacked you, she asked. Sniffing Stella Luna's fur, she whispered, You are Stella Luna. You are my baby. You escaped the owl, cried Stella Luna. You survived? Yes, said Mother Bat as she wrapped her wings around Stella Luna. Come with me and I'll show you where to find the most delicious fruit. You'll never have to eat another bug as long as you live. But it's night time, Stella Luna squeaked. We can't fly in the dark or we will crash into trees. We're bats, said Mother Bat. We can see in darkness. Come with us. Stella Luna was afraid, but she let go of the tree and dropped into the deep blue sky. Stella Luna could see. She felt as though rays of light shone from her eyes. She was able to see everything in her path. Soon the bats found a mango tree and Stella Luna ate as much of the fruit as she could hold. I'll never eat another bug as long as I live, cheered Stella Luna as she stuffed herself full. I must tell Pip, Flitter and Flap. The next day Stella Luna went to visit the birds. Come with me and meet my bat family, said Stella Luna. Okay, let's go, agreed Pip. They hang by their feet and they fly at night and they eat the best food in the world, Stella Luna explained to the birds on the way. As the birds flew among the bats, Flap said, I feel upside down here. So the birds hung by their feet. Wait until dark, Stella Luna said excitedly. We will fly at night. When night came, Stella Luna flew away. Pip, Flitter, and Flap leaped from the tree to follow her. I can't see a thing, yelled Pip. Neither can I, howled Flitter. I shrieked Flap. They're going to crash, gasped Stella Luna. I must rescue them. Stella Luna swooped about, grabbing her friends in the air. She lifted them to a tree, and the birds grasped a branch. Stella Luna hung from the limb above them. We're safe, said Stella Luna. Then she sighed. I wish you could see in the dark, too. We wish you could land on your feet, Flitter replied. Pip and Flap nodded. They perched in silence for a long time. How can we be so different and feel so much alike, mused Flitter. And how can we feel so different and be so much alike, wondered Pip. I think this is quite a mystery, Flap chirped. I agree, said Stella Luna, but we're friends and that's a fact.
Bears wondering, if bats and birds are different, how could they be friends? Hmm, well, did the birds share their home with Stella Luna? Yes, did Stella Luna share her home later too? Yes, did they have fun together and help each other? Yes, could that be how we make friends? even with those who are different? Well, Bear hopes you come back soon for more adventures in friendship. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you sometimes see your parent leaving home to go to work? Yes, some do Bear. Well, Noy sees his dad leave to go to work on his fishing boat every day. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what happens when a storm brings a big surprise for Noi. The Storm Whale by Benji Davies. Noi lived with his dad and six cats by the sea. Every day, Noy's dad left early for a long day's work on his fishing boat. He wouldn't be home again till dark. One night, a great storm raged around their house. In the morning, Noy went down to the beach to see what had been left behind. As he walked along the shore, he spotted something in the distance. As he got closer, Noy could not believe his eyes. It was a little whale washed up on the sand. Noy wondered what he should do. He knew that it wasn't good for a whale to be out of the water. I must be quick, he thought. Noy did everything he could to make the whale feel at home. He told stories about life on the island. The whale was an excellent listener. The night was drawing in, and it was growing dark. Noy was worried that his dad would be angry about having a whale in the tub. Somehow, Noy kept his secret safe all evening. He even managed to sneak some supper for his whale but he knew it couldn't last. Noy's dad wasn't angry. He had been so busy, he hadn't noticed that Noy was lonely. But he said they must take the whale back to the sea where it belonged. Noy knew it was the right thing to do, but it was hard to say goodbye. He was glad his dad was there with him. Noy often thought about the storm whale. He hoped that one day soon, he would see his friend again.
Bear's wondering, do you think the baby whale was happier in the tub or in the ocean? In the ocean, Bear, because that's his home. So do you think Noi did what was best for the whale? Yes? And do you think Noi's dad listened and understands what's best for Noi now too? Well, Bear hopes you come back soon for more adventures between fathers and sons. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever discovered a hello, goodbye window? No, not many have, Bear. Well, a little girl has discovered one at her grandparents' house. Her grandmother says it's a magic window. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what she thinks is so special about the hello goodbye window. The hello goodbye window. Story by Norton Juster. Nana and Poppy live in a big house in the middle of town. There's a brick path that goes to the back porch, but before you get there, you pass right by the kitchen window. That's the hello goodbye window. It looks like a regular window, but it's not. The kitchen is where Nanny and Poppy are most of the time. So you can climb up on the flower barrel and tap the window, then duck down, and they won't know who did it. Or you can press your face against the glass and frighten them. If they're not in the kitchen, you can't do any of those things, and you have to wait until next time. If they see you first, they wave and make silly faces. Sometimes Nana peekaboos me, which always makes me laugh. So I get a lot of extra fun and hellos before I even get inside. Just look at the kitchen. It's so big. It has a table you can color on and lots of drawers to take stuff out of and play with. But you can't touch anything under the sink. You could get very sick. There are shelves full of glass jars with lots of everything in them. A step stool so I can wash my hands and all kinds of pictures from the olden days. Nana says she even used to give me a bath in the sink when I was little. Really? Sometimes Poppy plays his harmonica for me. He can only play one song. Oh, Susanna, but he can play it a lot of different ways. He can play it slow or fast, or he can play it sitting down or standing up. He says he can even play it and drink a glass of water at the same time, but I've never seen him do that. When I stay over, we have our supper in the kitchen too. And when it's dark outside, we can look at our reflections in the window. It works just like a mirror, except it's not in the bathroom. And it looks like we're outside looking in. Poppy says, what are you doing out there? You come right in and have your dinner. And I say, but I'm here with you, Poppy. And then he looks at me in his funny way. Just before I go to bed, Nana turns off all the lights and we stand by the window and say 
Good night to the stars. Do you know how many stars there are? Neither do I, but she knows them all. In the morning, the first place we go is back to the kitchen, and there's the window waiting for us. You can look out and say good morning to the garden, or see if it's going to rain or be nice. And you can see if the dog next door is doing stuff in Nana's flower beds. She hates that. Sometimes Poppy says in a real loud voice, Hello world, what have you got for us today? Nobody ever answers, but he doesn't care. Poppy makes breakfast. He says it's his specialty. My favorite is oatmeal with bananas and raisins that you can't see because he hides them down inside. I find them all. When I get dressed, I help Nana in the garden. It's a very nice garden, but there's a tiger who lives behind the big bush in the back, so I don't ever go there. I ride my bike too. Not in the street, please. Or collect sticks and acorns. Not in the house, please. Or just kick my ball around. Sometimes when it's hot, Poppy chases me with the hose and I yell, Stop it, Poppy! Stop it! When he does, I ask him to do it again. Nana just shakes her head. When I get tired, I come in and take my nap and nothing happens until I get up. Then sometimes I just sit by the hello goodbye window and watch. Nana says it's a magic window and anybody can come along when you least expect it. Tyrannosaurus Rex. He's extinct, so he doesn't come around much. The pizza delivery guy. Pepperoni and cheese, he knows that's my favorite. The Queen of England. Nana is English, you know, so the Queen likes to come for tea. They all could come, and a lot more if they want. And if they do, I'll see them first. Mommy and Daddy pick me up after work. I'm glad because I know we're going home. But it makes me sad too because I have to leave Nana and Poppy. You can be happy and sad at the same time, you know. It just happens that way sometimes. When we leave, we always stop at the window to blow kisses goodbye. When you look from the outside, Nana and Poppy's house has lots of windows, but there's only one hello goodbye window, and it's right where you need it. When I get my own house someday, I'm going to have a special hello goodbye window too. By that time, I might be a Nana myself. I don't know who the Poppy will be, but I hope he can play the harmonica. Bear's wondering, would you like to discover a hello goodbye window too? Many yeses, Bear. Would you be the first to wave hello? <laughs> well, Bear's also wondering, when it's time to say goodbye, have you ever discovered that you feel the way the little girl did? Happy and sad? Hmm. Well, Bear hopes you come back soon for more adventures in discovering new things. Bye for now. Please subscribe.
Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Would you let a dog be in charge of cats? <laughs> Lots of no's, Bear. Well, Dog is about to be in charge of five cats while his family is out shopping. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what those five cats will do as soon as the family leaves. Dog in Charge by K.L. Going. Dog had a busy afternoon. Sit, dog sat. Stay. Dog stayed. Dance. Dog stood on his back paws and danced in a circle. Then dog got a scrumptious dog treat. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, thought dog. Good dog, smart dog, the very best dog. We're going to the store, so now you will be in charge. Watch the cats and make sure they don't get in any mischief. The family bustled and hustled out the door into the car. Dog watched them go, eyeing the cats lined up in a row. First we will sit and then we will stay, thought Dog. But the cats did not sit. Where did all the cats go? There were one, two, three, four, five empty spots. Dog looked in the kitchen. Down, barked Dog. Splash went the milk. Dog chased the cat into the living room. No cat. Or was there? Out! barked Dog. Swish! went the ashes. Dog looked in the bedroom. No cat. Or was there? Woof! barked Dog. Flump! went the blankets. Dog looked in the bathroom. No cat. Or was there? Come, barked Dog. Curlooey went the clothes in the hamper. Where were all the cats? Poof, went the powder puff. Bonk went the flower pots. Topple went the books. Bad cats, thought Dog. Soon the family would come home. Would he still be a good dog, a smart dog, the very best dog? Would he get more scrumptious dog treats? It was hard to be in charge. Dog was hungry and tired. He lay down to think. Then, Dog had an idea. Dog headed for the kitchen. Treats for good cats. Good kitty cat treats. Dog's tummy rumbled. Dog's nose twitched. Dog's mouth opened. Dog ate one, two, three, four, five cat treats. Soon the bag was empty. Poor dog. The family would not let him be in charge again. Dog had to fix everything. 
He tried to think, but his eyes grew heavy and his paw was soft. Then, one, two, three, four, five little noses appeared. Purr, went the cats. They loved dog. So, one, two, three, four, five cats licked up the crumbs and milk. One, two, three, four, five cats polished the living room. One, two, three, four, five cats neatened the bedroom. One, two, three, four, five cats straightened the bathroom. Then one, two, three, four, five cats snuggled up next to dog. The sound of a car rumbled in the driveway. The family was home. Good dog, smart dog, the very best dog. Dog got lots of scrumptious dog treats. Were the cats good while you were in charge? Dog barked. Woof. He stood on his back legs and danced in a circle. Good cats, thought dog. Smart cats. The very best cats. Bear's wondering, do you think Dog deserved those scrumptious treats? Yes, because he tried hard. Well, Bear says the cats deserve treats for cleaning up. Hmm, who deserves treats more? Dog or the cats? Or both? Please tell Bear what you think. Well, Bear hopes you come back soon for more adventures in being in charge. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you have a good friend you get along with really well? Except sometimes you don't? Wow, lots of yeses Bear. Well, Henry and Ruby are best friends. but. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what happens when they don't get along so well. Friends Mostly by Barbara Juice. Ruby and Henry, Henry and Ruby. Usually we're friends, but sometimes we're unfriends. It all depends. Ruby. For Henry's birthday, I give him something he really wants, like a fake nose and mustache, and not a coloring book. I cry at his pet funerals. I split my nutty bar so it comes out even. Henry. For Ruby's birthday, I give her lipstick because that is her favorite. I let her peel the nose off my banana. I never open her secret box. Henry. In circus, I'm the ringmaster and Ruby's the lion tamer. We're both 
the amazing suspenders who perform on the flying trapeze. Ruby. In Pirates, I dig for buried treasure, and Henry keeps an eye peeled for scurvy dog Sam. Then, Henry gets the gold doubloons, and I get all the rubies. These things are a very good trade. Ruby. But at swimming lessons, Henry did the dead man's float. All I could do was dead man. Wow, somebody said. Ruby sinks like a stone. So I splashed Henry's towel accidentally on purpose. Cut it out, he sputtered. Serves you right, I muttered. Who wants to be friends with a show-off? Ruby. Anyway, there are a million things to do when you're an only. Puzzles, bug watching, marching, whatever you want. I picked marching. Of course, I wore boots with silver spangles. I marched and drummed and drummed and marched and blew my whistle wheat in front of Henry's house. I did a twirl a gig and then Henry, I fell in behind her. What are you doing? She asked. I'm being the rest of the parade, I said, so you can be the leader. Oh, uh, Ruby is the fancy one, the dancy, prancy, chancy one. She twizzles like sparklers and fireflies and bracelets. Sometimes she's bossy, but she has ideas you usually want to do. This is why she is my best friend. Oh, Henry is the sturdy one, the zurly, burly, worry one. I can always count on Henry like a tree and peanut butter and purple. Sometimes he's a fraidy, but he almost always does things anyway. This is why he is my best friend. Henry, last night I had worry thoughts. What if Ruby finds another best friend? Nothing would be funny. Nothing would be regular. What would I do without Ruby? Ruby, yesterday I had gruffly thoughts that Henry won't do what I want, that Henry can ride without training wheels, that Henry got the biggest half. But then I think, what would I do without Henry? Henry, I said to Ruby, I'm afraid of the dark, and I sleep with a bear, and I call him Wetty Teddy. And then she told Ruby, but only one single person. Ruby, I said to Henry that I like Simon, that he has curls on his head, like little buttons, and I want to poke my finger in and make one spring. He told my secret to a boy. Henry, what's wrong with that? I'm a boy. Henry, after I told Ruby's secret, she cried. I'm sorry, I said. And after a while, Ruby said, okay. Ruby, after I told Henry's secret, his face got red. I'm sorry, I said, really sorry. After a while, Henry said, okay. Henry and Ruby, usually friends, but sometimes unfriends. Ruby and Henry go together 
for always and forever. Like mashed and potatoes. Like bellies and buttons. Like piggy and back. Not the end. Here's wondering, do you think Ruby is about to pop that balloon next to Henry while he's sleeping? <laughs> Lots of yeses, Bear. Hmm, do you think friends who are sometimes unfriends can still be best friends forever? Well, Bear hopes you come back soon for more adventures with best friends. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you like birthdays? <laughs> yes? Well, Bertie is about to have his birthday party, and he's having fun getting ready for his friends. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what game they play and what happens when his dad can't remember where he put Bertie's present. <gasps> Happy Birthday Bertie by Marcus Pfister. Today is Bertie's birthday. Happy Birthday Bertie, says Daddy and gives him a big birthday kiss. Bertie's friends are coming soon. He wants to be nice and clean for his birthday party, so he takes a bath. Bertie could sit in the tub for hours. He loves splashing in the water. He's hoping that Daddy will give him water goggles for his birthday. Hurry up, Bertie, calls Daddy. We still have lots to do. First, I want to open my present, says Bertie. One thing at a time, birthday boy, says Daddy. First, we have to bake a cake. Bertie helps by stirring the batter and licking the spoon. Then Daddy and Bertie cover the whole cake with a thick layer of chocolate frosting. They decorate it with candies and candles. Can I have my present now, asks Bertie. Not until we've put up the decorations, says Daddy. Every birthday party needs decorations. So they hang streamers and blow up brightly colored balloons and hang those up too. Careful, Bertie, says Daddy. Don't fall off that chair. Now can I unwrap my present, Bertie asks. But just at that moment, the doorbell rings. Bertie runs to the door and throws it open. There are Alex and Hannah and Benny. They stare at all the decorations. Come in, says Daddy. The party's in here. Come in, says Bertie. Bertie's friends have all brought presents. Bertie stacks them on the table in the hallway. Daddy would like to put his present there too, but he has forgotten where it is. He didn't want Bertie to find it, so he hid it. Now he can't find it. Before we eat cake and unwrap presents, how about a game, says Daddy. You all hide, and Bertie will try to find you. Daddy will try to find his present. Bertie finds Hannah first, hiding under the kitchen table, giggling. Something smells good. 
What can it be? The cake, of course. Hannah's and Bertie's mouths start to water. No one will know if we just take a little piece, says Bertie. Bertie finds Alex next, hiding behind the coats in the hallway. But there's something even more interesting in the hallway. Presents! No one will know if we just take a little peek, says Bertie. What do you think, Alex? Now there is only Benny to find. Where could he be? Benny is trying to make himself look small on top of the cupboard. I can see you, yells Bertie. Bertie's shout makes Benny jump. Down he tumbles, pulling all the decorations with him. Daddy comes running in. Is everything okay? Did you hurt yourselves? Bertie and Benny are sitting on the floor in a jumble of streamers and balloons. But what is that in the middle of the muddle? A bright blue package. It's Daddy's present for Bertie. He had hidden it on top of the cupboard. Daddy is so happy to find it. He tells them the story of the lost present and everyone laughs. <laughs> Soon the mess is cleaned up and the four friends sit down at the table. Daddy lights the candles and brings in the cake. They all sing happy birthday. Bertie makes a wish and blows out the candles. Finally, it's time for Bertie to open his presents. He already knows what's inside two of the boxes. A red ball from Hannah and a great book from Benny. He opens Alex's present. It's a rubber ring for swimming. But what did Daddy get him? Bertie can't wait to find out. Is it... It is! It's diving goggles! They will go perfectly with the rubber swimming ring. Can we go to the pool tomorrow? Bertie begs. I'm going to learn how to swim. It feels like it just began, but suddenly the party is over and Bertie's friends have to go home. Bertie gives Hannah, Alex, and Benny a big hug. You are my three best friends in the whole world, he tells them. At bedtime, Bertie gives Daddy a big hug too. Thank you, Daddy, he says. This was my best birthday ever. Bear's wondering, do you think Bertie's party was fun? Lots of yeses, Bear. How do you think Bertie was feeling on his birthday? Happy? Special? Do you think his dad and his friends enjoyed choosing presents for Bertie? Yes. Bear's asking, can you remember where his dad's present was hidden? Bear's hoping you come back soon for more adventures in celebrating. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here. It's story time with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you ever feel you need to be braver than you are? Sometimes? Well, if Rainbow Fish is going to help his sick friend, 
He has to swim through the dangerous sea monster's cave. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and swim with Rainbow Fish to see if he will be brave enough or not. Rainbow Fish and the Sea Monster's Cave by Marcus Pfister. Help! Come quick! The little blue fish was alarmed. His friends were there in a minute. What is it? What's wrong? Look at the bumpy-backed fish. He must be sick. He isn't moving and he doesn't answer me. He just groans. Let me through, said the swordfish. She went up to the bumpy-backed fish. Can you tell me what's wrong? The bumpy-backed fish moaned. My stomach aches. I feel terrible. You need red algae, said the swordfish. But the only place where red algae grows is on the other side of the sea monster's cave said the little blue fish. I'll go, declared Rainbow Fish. Are you out of your mind? cried the others. It's the most dangerous place in the entire ocean. That's where the rock monsters live. And a creature with a thousand arms to catch you. And the five-eyed globe fish. Rainbow Fish trembled. He almost changed his mind. But then he looked at the poor bumpy-backed fish lying in the sand. Bravely, he said, I'll go anyway. I'll come with you, cried the little blue fish. That made Rainbow Fish feel better. Quickly, they swam off before they lost their nerve. The sea monster's cave was dark and frightening. The rock walls were steep and jagged. Swim lower, whispered Rainbow Fish. That rock monster has his mouth open to eat us. The cave grew even darker. Suddenly, the little blue fish cried out, arm creature has caught me. Rainbow Fish tugged and pulled until his friend slipped out of the monster's slimy arms. That was a close call. Now he was really scared. Rainbow Fish looked down. The five-eyed globe fish is watching us, he whispered. The little blue fish shivered. Quick, let's get out of here, he said, and they swam as fast as they could until they finally emerged on the other side of the sea monster's cave. There they saw a big clump of red algae. The two friends picked as much as they could carry, and then they turned to go. The little blue fish hesitated. I can't go back through the cave. I'm too scared. Rainbow Fish was scared too, but he said, at least now we know what's in there. They looked at each other, gathered their courage, and swam off. Soon they saw the five-eyed globe fish. There's something funny about those eyes, said Rainbow Fish, and he swam a little closer. Then Rainbow Fish laughed. That isn't a five-eyed globe fish, he said. It's just the lanterns from five little lantern fish. Why, they aren't scary at all, said the little blue fish, giggling with relief. When they reached the creature with a thousand arms, they looked more closely. Seaweed, they said together and laughed. The rock monsters turned out to be just ordinary rocks. Unafraid, the two fish swam right by them and out of the cave to find their friends. 
You made it, the other fish cried. Did you see the rock monsters? Did anything try to eat you? We'll tell you everything later, answered Rainbow Fish. But first we have to give this red algae to the bumpy backed fish. The bumpy backed fish nibbled at the algae and soon he felt better. I don't know how I can thank you. It must have been dreadful to go through the cave. We were terribly afraid, Rainbow Fish admitted. But when we looked more closely, the monsters disappeared, interrupted the little blue fish happily. And then the two of them told the story of their journey and all the terrifying monsters that weren't really monsters at all. Bear's wondering, if you had a sick friend, would you try to be as brave as you could to help them? Many yeses, Bear. Bear's saying, maybe rainbow fish and the little blue fish helped each other be braver. So what do you think? Is it good for us to face whatever we're afraid of and try to help all we can? Hmm. Well, Bear hopes you come back soon for more adventures in being brave. Bye for now. Please subscribe.